double outlet ventricle. Now, this is the diagrammatic representation of the same condition. Now, uh, this is a rather complex anomaly. And again, it is part of the group of conotruncal anomalies. But there are a few controversies associated with this entity, and we will deal with it as we go along. So, uh, this is the double outlet ventricle in a general way, and there are two entities in this double outlet right ventricle and double outlet left ventricle. We are mainly concerned with double outlet right ventricle, which is uh, the more, much more commoner of the two. Now, what is the general definition of double outlet ventricle? It is a cardiac anomaly in which both the aorta and pulmonary artery are connected to the same ventricle. So, primarily, it represents a specific ventriculo-arterial connection. So, this ventriculo-arterial connection can occur with any atrial arrangement, any atrioventricular connection, and any ventricular morphology. Now, there have been a lot of uh, discussions and controversies about how to define this entity. To begin with, Newfield said that DORV, we will be mainly talking of DORV, that both great arteries and arterial trunk arise exclusively from a morphological right ventricle. And neither of the semilunar valves, that is aortic or pulmonary, is in fibrous continuity with the atrioventricular valve. And usually a VSD is present, which is the only outlet from the left ventricle. So here, please note that neither semilunar valve is in fibrous continuity. Now, this is the issue which has been uh, much debated upon. Now, conditions like DORV are often associated with pulmonary or subpulmonary stenosis in the majority of cases. Uh, before Newfield left, who had a huge collection of congenital heart disease specimens, and then subsequently uh, Wilson, uh, Wilcox and Anderson. They used less rigid criteria, and according to them, uh, when one complete arterial trunk and at least half the other arterial trunk emerge from the right ventricle, then it falls under the category of DORV. There may or may not be mitral aortic, mitral pulmonary artery continuity. So they did not emphasize on the fibrous continuity part of the uh, disease. And uh, therefore, if you use this criteria, some cases of TOF, to TOF, TOF with uh, uh, subaortic VSD and severe pulmonary stenosis could, if there is severe aortic override, could fall under the category of DORV. Likewise, TJ also could fall in the category of DORP. So, some such cases could also be considered as DORP. Then came Anderson and his colleagues subsequently, and they said it is basically an abnormal ventricular arterial connection, characterized by more than half of each great artery originating above the morphological right ventricle in half with two distinct and concordant AV, AV connections. Okay. So, the controversies regarding DORV are basically about the arteries 
So, what are the controversies regarding DORT? The main controversy is about the overriding of the VSD by the artery. So, um, Anderson, etc., follow the 50% rule. That means one artery arising wholly from the right ventricle and the other artery overriding a VSD. And that artery, when it overrides the VSD, 50% or more of that arterial uh, bag, that is annulus, should be across the VSD uh, in connection with the right ventricle. So, uh, so this is where the issue really comes. There are others who believe that the presence or absence of a conus is also an important factor. Now, in a normal heart, you know that there is a right ventricular conus which supports the pulmonary artery and there is a left ventricular conus which supports the aorta. But this conus is deficient and therefore you get fibrous continuity between the aortic valve and the mitral valve. Now, in situations like DORE, it is believed that it is an entity where both the conus are present. Therefore, there is a subaortic conus and there is a subpulmonary conus, and therefore, uh, uh, you may you will not get aortic mitral continuity. So this is the point of debate whether the conus is important in defining a DORV. And this is mainly the arguments are mainly based by morphologists or pathologists like us who would rather use the presence or absence of a particular uh, segment of the heart to define an entity. As far as the clinician and surgeon is con uh, con uh, considered, their interest is more in how much flow is going through the VSD into which particular artery and from the surgeon's point of view, how is the best way to correct this defect? So it doesn't matter to them very much whether the conus is there or the conus is not there. But uh, from the morphologist and the pathologist point of view, we would like to take into consideration the uh, presence of a conus uh, as part of a DORV pathology. Therefore, DORV resembles some cases of DORV would resemble fallows tetralogy and or transposition. So the earliest report of such a case came in 1703. It was known by different names. In 1793, John Abernathy, who was an assistant surgeon at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London, but described this entity as a partial transposition. So here you see the confusion in the labeling this entity comes about. Then in 1898, Carl von Wildert called it double outlet right ventricle partial transposition to signify that the aorta was transposed, but the pulmonary trunk was normally aligned. And then in 1957, we can introduce the term double outlet right ventricle as a diagnostic term for partial transposition complex. So instead of partial transposition, he said we should use the term double outlet right ventricle. So, between the 19th and 20th century, DORV was actually considered a type of transposition. Then, in 1949, Tausig and Bing, they are two separate individuals, described a patient with transposed aorta and pulmonary artery from the right ventricle. That means a DORV as we know of it now. But they called it complete transposition of aorta 
liver position of the pulmonary artery. That means the pulmonary artery was left of the aorta, but the aorta was transport, not the pulmonary artery. Then new field developed a classification of the ORD. In 1957, Kirkland was the first to repair the DORD with a subaortic VSD at the Mayo Clinic. In 1961, New Field gave a physiological classification, again emphasizing the position of the VSD and the presence or absence of pulmonary stenosis. This is more important from the uh, clinical perspective and from the surgeon's point of view. Then in 1968, Patrick and Magoon provided a surgical classification based on the relationship of the great artery and the VSD. Uh, if we look at the general incidence, it is 0 0.09 cases per 1,000 live births and constitutes 1 to 1.5 percent of congenital heart disease. There is no racial or sexual predilection cases. Now, what is the embryology of uh, this entity? So, Boone and Edwards, they said that DORV appears to represent a primitive embryological condition because there is Failure to achieve conotruncal rotation, conotruncal rotation, and a leftward shift of the conus. Now let us look at the embryological heart. Now this is a primitive heart, and here you have a primitive ventricular atrium which is getting divided into both the atria, a common atrioventricular canal with the developing atrioventricular septum and primitive ventricles. This is the left ventricle and this is the primitive right ventricle with a interventricular foramen or the septum. And this is the truncus which arises from the right ventricle which subsequently gets divided by the conal and truncal cushions and the aortopulmonary septum to form the aorta and pulmonary artery. So that's a spiral septum. Now in due course, this primary interventricular foramen uh, gets oriented towards the uh, LVOT. So it actually becomes part of the LVOT. So this is the so uh, they believe that this is a very double outlet right ventricle is a very primitive state of the physiological heart. So in normal development, the aorta is gets shifted to the left, and the subaortic infundibulum or the ventricular infundibular fold gets attenuated, shortened, or partially disappeared. And the septum between the arterial outlet, that is the truncal septum, is realigned. Realigned so that the pulmonary artery gets connected to the right ventricle and the aorta gets connected to the left ventricle. In DORD, there is failure of leftward migration of the aorta. And there is also failure of absorption of the ventricular infundibular fold. That is why we talk of the presence of double conus in cases of DORD. Means conus is there in the subaortic region and conus is there in the subpulmonary. There is variable rotation of the infundibulum clockwise or counterclockwise. And malalignment of the aortopulmonary and the outlet septum. So, all these, this is the normal development, and this is what happens in the OR. So, the essential features, anatomical features in DORD 
are you go know, in the sequential manner atrial situs atrioventricular connection atrial or arterial connection which is the most important part the vsc which is again the most important part outflow tract and the great artery so the great artery vsd ventricular arterial connection actually form the crux of a dorg so the vsd positions and the great artery relationship are very important in uh, defining dorg in the classification of dorg and so on So Van Praan believes that this is something to do with the conus. Now this is a very standard picture which you see textbooks regarding the presence or absence of the conus. Now in a normal heart you have subpulmonary conus, but no subaortic conus. In case of transposition, you have a subaortic conus. But no subpulmonic conus. Then there are conditions where you get conus in both the aorta and pulmonary artery. This we will put in the category of DORV. And when there is no conus at all present, then we will put it in the category of double outlet left ventricle. So DORV represents a spectrum of the whole of the conotrunkle anomaly and basically it um, extends from TOF, TOF to DORV to TGA. Now this is a normal heart say with a VSD. So you have the pulmonary artery which is anterior and to the left and aorta which is posterior and to the right. Now this is all at the level of the annula. Then with TOF, you find that the aorta moves a little more to the uh, right and pulmonary all artery also moves a little bit towards the uh, left. Then in DORV, in general, both the great arteries come to life side by side. And in TGA transposition, you see a complete reversal of this. Aorta is anterior and to the left. Pulmonary artery is posterior and to the right. So you see it's a spectrum of movement of the uh, aorta and pulmonary artery at the level of their annula. So that is why a lot of emphasis is on the position of the great arteries in DORV. Most commonly you find side by side situated great arteries. So the aorta is to the right and and pulmonary artery is left side by side. This is a classic example of DORV. Then you could get right posterior aorta, right anterior aorta or a left anterior aorta. So this is a diagrammatic representation. Now when there is a right lateral aorta, side by side relationship, the aorta is to the right of the pulmonary artery and the semilunar valve lie approximately in the same transverse and coronal plane. This is classically described as the uh, uh, great artery relationship in uh, and this is the most common type of uh, uh, situation in DORV, the most common type of relationship between great arteries. Now, this is um, actually what would be side by side, but in DORV, the aorta is to the right and pulmonary is to the left. So, these are various other uh, uh, situations less frequent. So you have right anterior aorta like you have here, um, left anterior aorta as you have here. 
aorta is anterior and to the right of the pulmonary tract, anterior in PGA. This is the normal position. However, this division according to the great artery relationship, we are talking only in cases with situs solitis of the atria and viscera and atrioventricular concordance two developed ventricles and uh, atrioventricular tract. But imagine situations where you can get other variations and combinations, including situs inverses, situs ambiguous, etc., as well as atrioventricular valve discordance. So with all these combinations, also you could get a DORE. So Putting all these together, you have 16 possible variations of DORV just based on the great arterial relationship and location of the VST. Now, suppose there is no VST, there is an intact ventricular septum. This is a situation difficult to understand and possibly the uh, newborn infant will not uh, survive for very long with an intact ventricular septum. So if you have an intact ventricular septum, it allows an additional four types of DORV depending on the great artery relationship. So there are 16 variations based on great artery and the relations and the VST with atrial and visceral cycles solitus atrioventricular concordance, two well-developed ventricles, and uh, the arterial valve. DORV with intact septum, four possibilities. And Dermont in 1976 to 78 has possibly finalized the largest series of DORV. So, as morphologists, as pathologists, we classify DORV based on the location of the VSD and its relationship to the great artery and the great artery relationship. <coughs> so, the VSD is very important and it is the only outflow from the left ventricle. Uh, the VSD is mainly ventricular. And DORV is therefore classified with respect to VSD. The VSD can be subaortic, subpulmonary, doubly committed, or non committed type of VSD. So these four types of VSD you will get in cases of DORV. So subaortic VSD, doubly committed VSD, which is very large and closely related to great artery. A VSD which is subpulmonic. This is described as toxic link complex and we will look at it in detail a little later. Then you have a VSD which is remote, which is generally an AV type of defect or a muscular type of defect. So this is a diagrammatic representation here you have a DORV with a subaortic VSD and therefore blood from the left ventricle will preferentially go into the aorta. Then you have a subpulmonic type of VSD. And please note that this is the infundibular septum uh, dividing the, separating the two great arteries. Therefore, when it is a subaortic VSD, the infundibular septum gets a little deviated towards the pulmonary outflow. So, this is the situation which will look like shadow. Then, here with subpulmonary VSD, here you have the flow preferentially going into the pulmonary trunk, and the infundibular septum gets deviated towards the aorta. There may be some subiotic narrow. Then this is where you have a large VSD which is committed to both the aorta and pulmonary artery. So blood from the left ventricle 
when preferentially go into the aorta and there is a remote VSD. A VSD which is not committed either to the aorta or the pulmonary Now, again, a diagrammatic representation of the double outlet right ventricle, a picture which is again seen in very many textbooks. The major type of uh, DOR, the 64 person, is the one where you get side by side relationship of the great arteries with a sub aortic VHD. That is 46%. Then you have less frequently a subpulmonic VSD. Then you have a remote VSD and a large VSD, doubly committed VSD. So this constitutes 64% of the cases of double outlet right ventricle. Then with demalposition of the great artery, which is the next most frequent, 26%. Here again, the subaortic VSD is the most common type. You can get normally related great vessels mainly along with subaortic VSD. So this is just to give you an idea of the frequency of different types of DORE, particularly in relationship to the great arteries and to the types of VSD. Now, clinically, what are the patterns? What we discussed so far were the anatomical, pathological patterns that we see. Group 1, where there is a subbiotic VSD with PS. This, of course, will resemble a tetralogy. The second group is the subpulmonary VSD with or without pulmonary stenosis. This will resemble a transposition. The group three, where there is subaortic VSD, no pulmonary stenosis, but with low pulmonary vascular resistance, it will resemble a simple VSD. Then group four is a subaortic VSD, no PS, but with a high pulmonary vascular resistance. This will resemble an Eisenmenger complex. So, um, so the physiological classification, it depends on the presence or absence of associated pulmonary stenosis, the relationship of VSD to great arteries, and therefore, as I have mentioned, DORB may simulate that of a large VSD a TOF or a TGF. So pulmonary stenosis is a very important part of the DORV complex. It is most common 40 to 70 percent. And it is often seen when there is a subaortic VSD. Otherwise, you can get bicuspid pulmonary valve and uh, when there is a subpulmonary type of uh, VSD, you will not get pulmonary stenosis. Other associated anomalies, subaortic stenosis, will be may be present when you have a subpulmonary VSD type. When you have a subpulmonary uh, VSD in a DORV setting. Uh, with subaortic stenosis, you will often get cooptation of the aorta. So, 50% of those cases will have cooptation of the aorta. Then, other associated anomalies are mitral valve anomalies in 10%, ASD in 10%, total anomalous pulmonary venous connection in 2%, AV canal defect. 5%. This is the type of remote VSD. Coronary arteries are usually normally, uh, uh, they have a normal pattern. Sometimes you can get patterns similar to that in TOF, LAD arising from right coronary arteries. 
or you can get patterns similar to what you may see in transposition. Or very rarely, anomalous origin of left circumflex from the right coronary artery, single coronary or, uh, ostium, origin of a right circumflex from the left coronary artery. So these are all exceedingly rare combinations. Most frequently, you have a normal coronary anomaly. So this is the most common types of VSD you are likely to see. Subaortic VSD with great arteries side by side. Subpulmonic VSD with great arteries side by side. Then a remote VSD with great arteries side by side and subaortic VSD with normally related great vessels. So here you see cases of specimens of DORV showing you the great arterial uh, uh, relation. So here you have the aorta is to the right, the pulmonary artery is to the left. The pulmonary artery is much, aorta is much larger than the pulmonary artery. Here again, a great vessels side by side. You have aorta to the right, pulmonary artery to the left, but note the size of the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery is extremely small and therefore you have, you, you can be sure that there would be pulmonary stenosis or subpulmonary stenosis. Not much of blood would be going into the pulmonary artery. Then aorta and pulmonary artery normally like you would get in a normal heart. Pulmonary artery is anterior and to the left. Aorta is posterior and to the right. Here again, aorta is anterior, pulmonary artery is posterior. You have to imagine this a little bit because it's not three-dimensional. So you have, again, a large aorta anterior and a small pulmonary artery, which is posterior. Again, indicating that there is probably pulmonary valvular stenosis or subpulmonary stenosis. Again, anterior and posterior, but here pulmonary artery is a little anterior, uh, anterior compared to the aorta. Now, this is the opened up heart. Opened up right ventricle. You can see the four trabeculations, the right atrium, tricuspid valve, the right ventricular outflow, the trabeculoseptoseptum marginalis, and you can see two outflows in this right ventricle. This is one outflow leading to the pulmonary valve. It is a little narrow. What is opened up is the outflow to the aorta. So this is quite dilated. There is a VSD here, which is subaortic. And this is the infundibular septum. Infundibular septum, which should have come between the two great artery annula. But here it is kind of going towards the right side. So this is actually more like a fallow type of picture, but there is massive overhead of the aorta over the VSD. You can see that this cusp is totally in the RV. This cusp is uh, these two are more than 50% overriding the aorta. So this is very significant aortic override. So it comes into the category of DORV. Now, as morphologists, we would look for continuity or discontinuity between the aortic valve and the mitral valve, which I cannot show you in this picture. But we have called this a DORV because there was uh, uh, no fibrous continuity between the aortic valve and the mitral valve. Here again is the septal band 
uh, dividing into two outflows is pulmonary outflow, which is narrowed. This is the pulmonary valve, and this is the other outflow going towards the aortic valve. And this is the deviated infundibular septum, almost like a fallow type of uh, picture. There is aortic to tricuspid valve fibrous continuity, and uh, again, it is difficult to comment upon the aortic to mitral valve uh, discontinuity. But if you look at this muscle band, which is part of the infundibular septum going upward, I would believe that there is aortic mitral discontinuity. That means there are two muscular infundibuli supporting the aortic and the pulmonary valve. Now, this is a DORV with again two outflows, but here the VHD is subpulmonic. This is the pulmonary valve, and this is the aortic valve, the infundibular septum, and this is the subpulmonic VHD. And this is the deviated part of the infundibular septum. At some places, there appears to be pulmonary valve to mitral valve continuity, but definitely no aortic valve to mitral valve continuity. The same, this is again a VSD all opened up from the right ventricle, tricuspid valve, the interventricular communication, and the pulmonary. Valve, and this is the aortic valve. Here again, another clear picture. Um, right ventricle with two outflows, one leading to the aorta with a VSD here, the other leading to the pulmonary artery. See the narrowed pulmonary stenosis. There is pulmonary stenosis. The proximal pulmonary artery is extremely small. Aorta is dilated. Blood from the left ventricle would come through the VSD and preferentially go into the aorta. Yeah. So here we see a double outlet right ventricle showing you very significant uh, subpulmonary stenosis. This is the pulmonary valve. There is probably a subaortic VSD, but this is to show you the degree of subpulmonary stenosis here. So this is a subpulmonic VSD. Two outflows, one leading to the aorta, the infundibular septum, which is deviated towards the aorta, a subpulmonic VSD, pulmonary valve, which is kind of overhanging the VSD. So, again, a subpulmonic VSD here and overhanging pulmonary valve. The pulmonary valve ring is quite dilated. So, this is known as the toxic bing complex. DORV with a subpulmonic VSD, narrowing of the aortic outflow, which is often associated with interruption of aorta and coarctation of the aorta. Now, some interesting features of TOSIG and BING. And therefore, in 1949, TOSIG and BING, Helen TOSIG and Richard BING, they described a heart clinically and pathologically in which Aorta emerged completely from the right ventricle while the pulmonary trunk straddled the ventricular septum over a defect in the septum, but emerged mostly from the right ventricle. So this became known as the toxic bing heart. So in 1966, Lev reviewed the literature of the spectrum of anomaly and he reported 25 or 47 cases. He had a huge registry of congenital heart disease. And he suggested that the concept of toxic being heart should be 
origin of aorta completely from the right ventricle uh, unrelated to the VSD with pulmonary trunk related to the VSD but emerging partially or completely from right ventricle. He did not want to use the term earlier. They used to be called as partial transposition. He did not want to use the term partial transposition or DORP. Now, there are some interesting facts about uh, Tossig and Bing. Now, Tossig was, is actually Dr. Helen Tossig. And uh, she was born in the early 1900s, 1907 or so. But uh, imagine uh, she was born uh, at uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her father was a professor at Harvard. But she was born as a dyslexic child. And uh, she then developed tuberculosis. Mother died of tuberculosis. And she recovered, but it left her with progressive deafness. So here is a young lady who is dyslexic, who is partially deaf. And she was very keen on doing medicine. So she was uh, quite bright academically in spite of her dis uh, disability. And she tried to get into Harvard Medical School. So this must have been somewhere in the 1920s. But Harvard Medical School would not admit female students because they were under the impression that the females would contaminate the minds of the young men. So they refused her admission, but permitted her to audit some courses but she could audit these courses by only sitting on the back bench, far away from most of the male students. So this was the discrimination faced in those times. However, she was not the one to give up. She went and joined John Hopkins Medical School, which was uh, willing to take in female students. And then she continued in John Hopkins Institute lifelong till the end of her career. And here she was joined by Richard Bing. Richard Bing came from Denmark. He did his medical studies in Denmark and subsequently migrated to Europe during the Nazi regime. So they both worked together and described toxic Bing complex. And uh, so this is about Tossig and Bing. Now, Helen Tossig became very well known in her specialty. She was a pediatrician with a lot of interest in heart diseases. But um, Richard, Bing, she actually became the first uh, woman president of the American Heart Association. She also became a uh, the American College of Cardiology used to give a gifted educator, educator award. And she was the first woman who got this award. Then later on, Lyndon Johnson gave her a Medal of Freedom Award. So with all her uh, disabilities, she reached to great heights. But Richard Bing in somewhere in his article has mentioned that she was a very difficult person to get along with. And one can understand that because she must have been so sensitive about her uh, disability. So this is a little interesting uh, sideline about uh, Helen Tossig and Bing. And one can understand and uh, um, appreciate the difficulties that women faced in those eras. But she had the great will and power to overcome these difficulties. So uh, coming back to DORB, so DORB with remote VSD. Now look at this VSD. Neither committed to the aorta or pulmonary artery, separated from both of them by thick bands of muscle. And definitely here there is aortic mitral discontinuity. That means there are double conus. 
So remote VSD with outflow obstruction. This is a remote VSD and this is the outflow obstruction to the pulmonary valve. The outflow here, it's like an os infundibulum, a narrowed infundibular chamber. Another one of the same picture. So pulmonary stenosis is the most common associated anomaly. And 70% of cases with malposition of great arteries, uh, you may find an absent or a rudimentary pulmonary valve. Other associated anomalies could be ASD, atrioventricular valve anomalies like a atrioventricular type of VSD, mitral valve anomalies like a cleft or a parachute mitral valve, straddling mitral valve, supravalvular ridges, etc. And sometimes DORV is associated with heterotaxy syndrome, asplenia, total anomalous pulmonary venous connections, cleft SVC, unbalanced AV septal defects, hypoplastic LV, etc. So the single ventricle complex, which we know of, that is associated with heterotaxy syndrome. And DORV can sometimes be seen in such situations. Now, this is a DORV with AV canal defect. So here is the common AV valve. This is the right ventricle. And this is the bridging common AV can, uh, uh, atrioventricular valve. This is the same opened out from the left ventricle. This is the crest of the ventricular septum. And you can see the bridging leaflets. Uh, DORP with parachute mitral valve. Now parachute mitral valve means there is only one belly of papillary muscle to which all the cordae of the mitral valve, the anterior and the posterior valve cordae are attached to this single belly of papillary muscle. There is a subaortic VSD here. Sometimes there is, uh, this is a, a DORV with a subaortic VSD and the outflow to the pulmonary tract is significantly narrow. This is the small os infundibulum that you can see. And this infundibular chamber extends all the way to the, almost to the apex of the right ventricle. So this is considered as a double chambered RV. You may miss this double chambered RV because this opening can be extremely small. So you may say this is a subaortic VSD with pulmonary atresia. But actually, if you look very carefully, you will see that there is a separate part of the right ventricle, which is the infundibular chamber. Then DORV with dextrocardia of the heart. Now, what about the conduction system? <laughs> the conduction system is generally related to the VSD and runs on the crest of the ventricular septum with a long non-branching component. In many cases, it is similar to what you will see in TOF or isolated perimembranous VS. So here you have the VSD with the, which is subaortic and you have the conduction system running on the crest of the VSD and then dividing into the uh, right and left bundles. If the VSD is subpulmonic, then this division is quite far away. If it is uh, a large VSD, then again you have the uh, uh, common bundle of his quite far away from the margin of the VSD. But they would all be somewhere related to the VSD. But here you have a good margin. A remote type of VSD or an AV canal VSD would definitely be related very closely with the conduction system. These are all important from the surgeon's point of view. 
example of the clinical pattern, you see we have seen the pathological or morphological pattern. Group one is a subaortic BSD with PS. It will present like a TOS. Then you have subpulmonary VSD with or without PS. It will resemble a TGA clinically. Then group three is subaortic VSD, no PS, but with low pulmonary vascular resistance. It will resemble a simple VSD. Group four with a subaortic VSD, no PS, but a high pulmonary vascular resistance. It will resemble an Eisenmenger complex. So when you, since a majority of cases of DORB have a subaortic VSD, then you will see that the right ventricular blood also goes into the aorta. The LV blood also goes into the aorta. Therefore, the aortic saturation is decreased. Pulmonary blood flow is decreased, like what you get in TOF. If you have a subpulmonary VSD, then from the left ventricle, blood will go into the pulmonary trunk. And from the right ventricle, the pulmonary, uh, the blood will go into the aorta and to some extent into the pulmonary trunk. Therefore, the aortic pulmonary saturation would be low. Now, in the event that pulmonary vascular resistance is decreased, the aortic saturation may be fairly decent, but there will be a left vol uh, ventricular volume overload. If the pulmonary vascular resistance is high, blood from both the RV and the LV will go into the aorta and the aortic saturation decreases. So subaortic VSD with decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance, no PS, it will resemble a simple uh, VSD. The pulmonary blood flow is decreased and aortic saturation is normal to begin with. But if the PVR is increased, then there will be increased flow in the aorta decreased flow in the pulmonary trunk and aortic saturation will fall. Echo three findings are necessary. One, you have to demonstrate origin of the great arteries from the right ventricle. A mitral semilunar valve discontinuity, if you want to be differentiated from phallus tetralogy and absence of a definitive LV outflow. Um, in a transverse plane, short axis view, you will find that the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve are almost at the same level. The aortic valve is not as wedged as you would see in a normal heart. And this is the apical five chamber view. And here you see the ven muscular ventricular septum, the crest of the septum, and the subaortic VSD. And here you see, this is the mitral valve. And you see a good bit of muscle here. This is the infundibular septum, which you would not see in a normal, or which you would not see in a phallus tetralogy. So here definitely there is aortic mitral discontinuity because of the presence of this infundibular septum, ventricular infundibular fold. So what is the natural history of this disease? Infants without pulmonary stenosis may develop severe congestive heart failure and later on may develop pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. If by chance the VSD closes spontaneously, then it will result in a fatal outcome. When pulmonary stenosis is present, then you will have complications of congestive cardiac heart failure, polycythemia, cerebrovascular accident, etc. In a toxic being situation, you have severe pulmonary vascular obstructive disease developing very early on in the uh, uh, early infancy. 
But if you have associated anomalies like co-optation, LV hypoplasia, etc., then the prognosis is very, very poor. So management includes medical care and surgical management. So the idea of medical management is to do medical treatment before surgical intervention can be attempted. Surgical can be palliative or definitive. And therefore, one who has to evaluate uh, extensively all these features to decide whether and the status of the baby to decide whether to go in for palliative or definitive management, surgical management, but taking into account the medical care that is required before surgical intervention is possible. So when there is a situation of inadequate pulmonary blood flow, the attempt should be made to keep the ductus patent by giving prostaglandins, etc. So if there is a clinical picture of congestive heart failure, you give inotropic support, diuretics, etc. So surgical care basically palliative. So this approach helps to improve the uh, patient's clinical condition, allowing the baby to gain weight and to achieve optimal conditions for definitive surgical repair. If the baby has pulmonary stenosis, then you can do a BT shunt, and especially if the oxygen levels are low. And for better mixing of blood, particularly in the toxic bing type of complex, one could do an atrial septostomy, either a blade or a balloon atrial septostomy. This will cause decompression of the LA, which causes pulmonary venous congestion. So surgically, the goals of repair are to establish connection from the LV to the aorta. So you have to connect the LV to the aorta, connect the RV to the pulmonary artery and close the VSA. So what are the contraindications to perform a biventricular repair when there is significant left ventricular hypoplasia or there is straddling of the atrioventricular valve? Then also you will see that one of the chambers may be smaller or hypoplastic. After repair, the major problems are ventricular dysfunction. This may occur due to associated factors like residual VSD, the atrial, uh, arterial valve insufficiency, and prolonged circulatory arrest during the intracardiac repair. So major concerns after surgery are LV obstruction. And LV outflow obstruction is due to proliferation of the fibrous tissue at the level of the VSD. And this may distort the intraventricular baffle or make or hypoplasia of the aortic annulus. Eight post-operative complications are arrhythmias and sudden cardiac deaths. And uh, uh, especially these factors are important when repair is done at an older age. Ventricular dysfunction, increased pulmonary artery pressures, all these are complications if the baby is operated at a later stage in life. So palliative procedures involve pulmonary artery banding when there is DORV without PS, muscular VSD, remote VSD, when there would be a lot of blood going into the pulmonary artery. Simple DORV with a subaortic VSD, pulmonary stenosis, then you do a repair like you would do in phallostetrology in infancy. If it is a more complex DORV, then the uh, 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 the treatment would basically evolve around establishing 
LB aortic continuity by using a tunnel or establishing RV pulmonary artery continuity and enlargement of the RV outflow by an extra cardiac conduit. So it could be a surgery which combines TGA with mustard sending for a pair. So here is how you close the subaortic defect by using a patch. And this is how the patch would look like after closure. And uh, so that the left ventricular blood gets diverted into the aorta. So this is like a TOF repair. Now, if there is pulmonary stenosis, you have to repair the VSD and then uh, open out the uh, outflow of the pulmonary tract obstruction and put a pericardial patch across the right ventricular outflow into the pulmonary artery. So here you put a patch like this. The aorta is committed to the left ventricle after closure of the VA. So this completes the whole spectrum of AORV pathology. And uh, thank you for your patient listening. And if there are any questions, I would be willing to answer it.